The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is my privilege to welcome you to worship at Second Presbyterian Church. Uh, if you are a guest here, if you are being led by the Spirit to uh, explore uniting with this congregation, uh, please leave a message uh, for us in the uh, friendship pad or speak with one of the pastors here, and we will gladly uh, help you in that process. But again, we welcome all online as well as in person today. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's kindnesses. And today, this opportunity, together as the people of God, is surely one of those great kindnesses. We worship God as we sing uh, our hymn sing. Yes. Good morning. Someone asked me this week, how did this uh, tradition of singing at the beginning of the service in the summer uh, begin? And I don't know, but I think it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and I know it's been more than 40 years, so we are very delighted that uh, we continue this great tradition. This morning we have hymns 1 through 449. And I'm going to do an odd little thing, and I'm going to start over on this, this uh, section over here on the side. Is anybody, does anybody have a favorite hymn in uh, 1 through 449 that you'd like to choose? We can come back. Oh, I see a hand back there. Which, okay. Did you say 465? Okay, that's in the second half, but we'll go ahead and... Do you have that? Okay, good. We do each half because he has a, a book that goes for each half of the hymn, but he had it handy, so we've got you covered. 465. <laughs> back there. Yes, back there. 418. 418.
him eight. the font of identity, and the table of sustenance, children of God, welcome home. Friends, we come as we are before the cross of Jesus. We are invited to be restored and forgiven, each one of us and all of us together. Let us Loving Creator, with a gardener's tender touch, you planted your people to bear good fruit. But we bear wild grapes with a welder's fierce fire you fashioned your people to glorify you. But we are riddled with impurities. In your generous mercy, O oh God, regard the vine you planted, save and restore us. Reform the vessel you crafted, 
Cleanse and refine us. Give us life, O God, that with our whole being we may worship you rightly. Friends, be assured of this. When we come as we are, and we tell the truth about who we are and how we are, God forgives us. It is the work of God and the promise of Jesus to all who come to the cross that we are forgiven. Amen. proclamation of God's forgiveness carries with it the promise of God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And as we share a sign of peace, we invite the youngsters to go ahead and go to their programming.
Let us pray. Open our ears and humble our hearts as we approach your word read and proclaimed today, great God. May we listen, discern, and follow the path you intend for us. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah. Listen now for the word of the Lord. I will sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded rotten grapes. And now, inhabitants of uh, Jerusalem and people of Ju Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield rotten grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a wasteland. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the host of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his cherished garden. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews. I'm reading from the uh, Revised English. No, that's not right. Yes, that is right. Yes, the Revised English Bible, which is an upgrade or an, uh, a successor to the New English Bible. And this uh, epistle at this point, uh, the author is doing a roll call of the saints. He is talking about uh, all those from Israel's history uh, who were uh, exhibiting great faith along the way. And we pick it up here in verse 29. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though it were dry land, whereas the Egyptians, when they attempted the crossing, were engulfed. By faith, the walls of Jericho were made to fall after they had been encircled on seven successive days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab escaped the fate of the unbelievers because she had given the spies a kindly welcome. Need I say more? Time is too short for me to tell the stories of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets. Through faith, they overthrew kingdoms, established justice, saw God's promises fulfilled. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of fire, escaped death by the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They grew powerful in war. They put foreign armies to rout. Women received back their dead, raised to life. Others were tortured to death, refusing release to win resurrection to a better life. Others again had to face jeers and flogging, even fetters and prison bars. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were put to the sword. They went about clothed in skins of sheep or goats, deprived, oppressed, ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. 
They were refugees in deserts and on the mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these won God's approval because of their faith, and yet they did not receive what was promised. Because with us in mind, God has made a better plan that only with us should they reach perfection. With this great cloud of witnesses around us, therefore, we too must throw off every encumbrance and the sin that all too readily restricts us and run with resolution the race which lies ahead of us, our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that lay ahead of him, he endured the cross, ignoring its disgrace, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. I doubt it could be the case, but it may be part of getting older that my vision is not exactly what it used to be, especially at night. Not too long ago, I realized something, and it was painful. I realized that when I was driving, that my focus, my gaze was just in front of the car, you know, past the hood, not right in front of the car, but, but my focus was maybe 40, 50 feet out. Well, any, any driving instructor, any expert will tell you that is not the safest or most effective or smoothest way to drive, right? No, how are you taught to drive? But instead, what we're supposed to do, they say, is to uh, focus on, keep our gaze on something far down the road, keep our gaze well ahead of the car, and our peripheral vision will take care of the rest. So, lately, I've been making a conscious effort to do just that to raise the line of vision a little bit to what's coming, to see it well in advance, to get a clearer view of what lies ahead. But it is so easy to fall back into that habit, right? That habit of fixing one's gaze at what is just ahead. This writer to the Hebrews, the preacher, is like a coach in the locker room at halftime. And he's trying to encourage or motivate a a team that is just getting stomped. And he does the coach ease language, right? You can still turn this around. You have what it takes. Remember how you were in the same situation a number of times and, well, you managed to claw your way back and to make it a game and maybe even to win? Now get on out there and do it. Well, the preacher's group, the preacher's team is a whole bunch of Christians who are weary They are weary, they are frustrated, they are sometimes indifferent, they are lethargic, they are frightened disciples of Jesus, who they believe is the Messiah. They are tired, they're just tired. They're tired of struggling to be faithful in a world that does not reward it at all. They're tired of criticism. They're tired of mocking. They are tired of rejection and even violence at the hands of the people with whom they live and work, the people around them in that community. 
And to use another sports metaphor, they are ready to throw in the towel. They are ready to walk away from that community of faith with all of its demanding ways. And some of them already have walked away. And the preacher comes to them and says, remember, remember your ancestors in the faith. Remember all that they endured, all that they had to put up with, and how they managed to hang in there and to stay faithful to the end and to trust that God was bringing something better their way. And if they can do it, you can do it. Remember them and get back in the race. Most of all, says the preacher, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who has already run the race, who endured, who trusted God, and who reached the finish line for all of us. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Now, the New Revised Standard Translation of the Bible uh, says it this way, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Now, that's not inaccurate, but every other Bible translation I looked at has some version of eyes fixed on Jesus. And that to me is certainly uh, a stronger image, a stronger picture of what we're being called to do. It speaks to this ongoing, unwavering focus on Jesus as we make our journey of life, our journey of faith. There's an old folk song and I learned something new this week. That was nice. An old folk song that used to encourage its listeners, keep your hand to the plow, hold on. And somewhere along the way, somebody changed the lyrics to keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. And that became kind of an anthem during the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. That song was sung during the Montgomery bus boycott, sung by black people who were tired, tired of segregation, Tired of discrimination, tired of oppression, tired of empty promises. And those folks chose to walk everywhere, especially to work and back. And many of them were working in jobs that required them to be on their feet all day. And then on top of that, they were walking eight, 10 miles a day. They chose to walk rather than supporting the bus company that enforced that Jim Crow rule that said black people had to sit in the back of the bus or at least behind the most upfront white person. That boycott, and I didn't remember this, but I was not born yet, but I didn't remember from history that this boycott lasted 381 days, from December of 55 to December of 56. And there was one walker, a woman known as Mother Pollard, we don't know her real first name, but she was called Mother because she was 
a saint, an elder in the church. He was an elder at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And that happened to be Martin Luther King's church. Dr. King suggested to Mother Pollard as that boycott wore on and on that because of her age, she was around 72, and that sounds young to me now, but because of her age and because of her health, maybe she should consider riding the bus again. Once in a while, at least. And she gave this famous reply to him. My feet is tired, but my soul is rested. Her, her focus, her gaze was on the promise of what was coming. The promise of knowing the joy of a more just world. And she kept her eyes on the prize. In fact, she encouraged Dr. King in his, in his own tired and discouraged times, encouraged him to keep running the race. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, keeping our eyes on the prize is the preacher's remedy for all discouragement, despair, and fear as we walk our own road of faith. But Lord, how easy it is to lose focus. How easy it is to fix your eyes on everyone, including self, everyone but Jesus. How easy it is to fix our eyes on everything but Jesus' way. As someone once put it, we are often like a dog who wanders into a whistling convention. We're pulled this way, we're pulled that way, we cannot get settled, we are frantic. We don't know who to follow. We don't know where to go. Help, help. Without the right focus, we flounder. We drift. Another well-known person from that boycott, Rosa Parks, her refusal to take a back seat was the ignition for that boycott. She once said this, Stand for something, or you will fall for anything. Today's mighty oak is yesterday's nut that held its ground. What is it that anchors you? Where is your focus? Where do you direct your gaze? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. What does that mean? How do we keep our focus? Well, certainly it means the things that we do as people of faith. It means prayer and scripture and worship. But I think the preacher is also saying that focusing on Jesus is not an activity but it is a way of life. It is a way of being. It's not just turning to Jesus when uh, we need something, not just turning to him when our world falls apart. To fix our eyes on Jesus means that we orient, we steer, we guide our lives by him that he is our compass, he is our map, 
His presence with us, his values, his vision of what it means to be fully human, his vision of who God is, his vision of how God is at work in this world, that's what orients us, grounds us, anchors us, and leads us to what is true, what is real. As an old spiritual puts it, and we were going to sing this today, but we decided not to. I admit it. Jesus is the one who guides my feet while I run this race. Our mission co-worker friends, Sherry and Dustin Ellington, were with us a couple of Sundays ago. They assisted in worship. They made a presentation after worship on just what does it mean to be a missionary these days anyway. I know them well enough to know. Known them 12 years. To know that they uh, certainly haven't had to endure what some of the preacher's witnesses had to endure in that text for today, torture, imprisonment, poverty but I also know them well enough to know that they have endured the pain of giving themselves, giving themselves fully to a ministry in Egypt and then being falsely accused of proselytizing and thrown out of the country and while one of them was away on business and came back, the authorities would not let them into the country while the other was still in Egypt and they were separated for a time. They've known the agony of being halfway around the world from a college-age child who had serious health concerns and they couldn't be with him. They've known the anxiety of not knowing where funding would come for their ministry. They've known the disappointment of a denomination that no longer is able to make their ministry a priority. And as they shared their slides, and some of you saw that, slides of colleagues and friends and students at a seminary in Zambia where Dustin taught for 10 years, as we saw the slides of, of what kind of work they did there to train future Presbyterian ministers in a country dying for more and more Presbyterian ministers because the church is growing so fast. As they went through that, I believe I caught a glimpse of what it means to fix your eyes on Jesus. I am inspired by their steadfast focus, their laser focus, by the, uh, uh, the prize uh, that they pursue. And that prize for them is to witness to and to tell others the story, to teach them about this Jesus, this one who came to bring abundant life this one who walked the way of mercy and forgiveness. This one who stood with the lost and the least, who dined with the outcast and the sinner. This one who trusted that obedience to God's way of justice, God's way of love, whatever the consequences might be, that that way is the way to true joy and true life. This Jesus who showed every one of us that the ultimate power is the power of costly, self-giving love. Of course, we are not missionaries like the Ellingtons. Probably never will be, though there may be some younger folks here who receive that call someday. But then again, we are missionaries. We are mission co-workers just like them. And we are called to focus 
our eyes on and orient our lives by Jesus. His faithfulness to God's way gives us the courage, the strength to live faithfully, come what may. Through our own times of doubt and despair and pain, every one of us, every one of us, whatever stage of life we happen to be in, whatever situation we find ourselves in, every one of us by the power of the Spirit can join the company of those who keep their eyes on the prize, the prize who is Jesus. In your ordinary, everyday life, think about it. You can offer forgiveness to someone who's undeserving, in your view, of forgiveness. You can be present for the lonely. You can speak up and you can speak out about injustices that damage and dehumanize so many. You can make risky and costly decisions for the sake of the well-being of someone else. You can refuse to buy into the lie that money and power and violence rule this universe. The lie that hate wins and death is invincible. You can do that. And the great cloud of witnesses sings. And we join in. Hold on. Hold on, keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. And to God be all glory, praise, and honor this day and always. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me as we affirm our faith together. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Please be seated. All that we are and all that we have already belong to God. So let us give back what has generously been given to us. Oh, 
which means school has started or is about to start and that means our calendars are beginning to fill up and that also includes our church's calendar and so as our programmatic years begin um, we would like to invite y'all to keep an eye out for information on volunteering to uh, paint or clean our building to make it in the best shape possible um, before our programmatic year begins. Um, there is something very exciting happening tonight that might involve jazz in the Rechtenwalds, maybe? It, it might, and indeed will. We hope that you will join us tonight at 6.30 in the Chapel Circle. We are pleased to present uh, Nick Rechtenwald and his, court, his jazz quartet, some of the folks that he's been playing with up in uh, Bloomington, but also his, uh, his mom, Christina, and his sister, Isabella, Isabella goes to college tomorrow, so we get a, uh, one more chance to hear Isabella as well tonight. So I hope you'll come. We worship together, we fellowship together, have some refreshments, and uh, I think it's going to be pretty good weather. I haven't looked at the forecast, but um, we're hoping the rain, if it does happen, is early. But come, we're going to have a great time together. Also, I want to invite you on August the 28th, we'll have our homecoming at 2nd. Uh, that begins with a, a, a live and live stream service here in the sanctuary. It's a, a casual time. I think we're invited to dress casually because we'll be enjoying afterward a lunch out on the chapel circle as well. Uh, we'll have some time to fellowship there, and then there'll be an opportunity for all the, the ministry areas to have a time to share with you uh, around some informal time around table. Uh, to, to give you some information about what's all ahead. But it's a time to gather again as we look forward to great programming in this wonderful place. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I invite Sonny Seal to uh, speak to us a little about spot groups this morning. Thank you. My name is Sunny Seal, and I am the new SPOT coordinator for Second Pres. The SPOT program is Second Pres Options Together, and that is the small group ministry here at the church. And inside the bulletin today, you will find a SPOT list of all of the small interest groups, and um, I hope you will look over that. We're going to have a fall kickoff on August 28th for you to sign up for an interest group. And uh, that right now we have 10 groups, but if you find on this list that your interest is not listed and you would like to start a new group, please contact me so we can add your group to the list. Um, Matthew 18:20 says, when two or three are gathered in his name, I will be in your midst. Uh, so speaking to some of the spot groups, I heard an interesting story where one lady was, uh, had surgery, and it was her small group that became the heart and the hands of Christ by ministering to her after her uh, surgery. They brought food to her, they sent cards, they dropped in to check on her recovery, they uh, phoned to see how she was doing. So I hope that you will look over this list and find a spot where you fit. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonny. Rich just leaned over to me and said, I thought spot uh, meant second prez on tap. So maybe that's not an option right now, but maybe Rich will uh, start that option for all of us on uh, when August 28th. So thank you, Sonny, for teaching us a little more about what spot really means. Um, our mission of the month for August is Bellwood, and in our weekly uh, Seconds to Go email, there is um, a more complete list of what uh, items they are looking for. So I invite you to go and look in our weekly Seconds to Go email um, and support our mission partner, Bellwood. Um, Steve, would you like to say something about next week? Sure. I'm just getting tired hearing all the things that are on the calendar already that we do have we're going to add a couple of more next week we will have a guest preacher here steve eason who's retired presbyterian minister uh, lives in brevard north carolina did i say that right uh was at myers park Pres, one of our uh, big churches in uh, north carolina also for many years uh, i spent an hour on the phone with steve one time so we're kind of like simpatico you know we like to to uh, talk a lot, and uh, he's an easy guy to get to know, and I think he uh, will bring a, a good message, a powerful message to us next Sunday. Afterward, we will have a presentation that he's going to lead uh, in Fellowship Hall on how the church and the culture around us has changed so dramatically in recent years, and how we as people of faith can respond in, in a hopeful way to all of that change. So, and we'll have a, we'll have a meal too. So uh, make it a day next Sunday for the uh, renewal preaching series here at Second. And don't forget, October Blessed, our party, uh, our big fundraiser of the year. October Blessed is on October the 1st. And there's lots of information going out. You may have been contacted about a sponsorship. That is going extremely well, so thank you, and thanks to all who are putting it together. But uh, Maggie, why don't you raise your hand back there? There's Maggie Forrest. Uh, Maggie is helping lead that along with Allison in the balcony. And uh, if you have questions about that, please check with them and pay attention to what is sent out in emails and uh, email blasts. So that will be October the 1st, and we look forward to that very much. Thank you, Steve. Now, as we turn to God in prayer, let us remember the Morrow family on John's death. His visitation and service will be this Saturday at 10 and 11 here. Let us go to God in prayer. God of all that is good, we know that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and yet we come here convinced of many things, but trusting in very few. So holy God of limitless surprises, meet us here in this place as we touch that which cannot, we cannot see, that which we have not dared to hope. O oh, Holy One, we thank you that we stand in a long line of believers who have been faithful through the ages. You have been leading your people through trial and difficulty and have always set before them hope for today and hope for a better tomorrow. We pray that you would bless us in our time as we seek to be as faithful as those who have gone before us. May we too know the faith which is filled with hope in things not seen. Give us a faith such as Abraham's to move forward, not knowing our destination, but trusting in your guiding providence. Give to us a faith like the grain of mustard seeds, which had small beginnings, but yielded large results. Give to us the faith to move the mountains of difficulty which come to each of us. Give to us a faith which has a vision of a new world where peace and love characterize the transactions of people and of nations and where war is no more. 
Give to us a faith which is able to endure those moments of trial and doubt and to trust that you are with us. Give us a faith which sees the welfare of humankind as our business, because after all, it is the focus of your enduring love for your people. Give to us a faith which sees beyond the years to an eternal city. God, give us faith to walk with you through the ebb and flows, through the ups and downs of life. And God, you are the light upon our path. Guide us so that we orient our path to you, to live our lives with our eyes on the prize, on Jesus. And great God, deserving of all our honor and praise, we lift these prayers to you. Now, as the body of Christ, hear us as we pray the prayer Christ taught us, sing, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us go out into God's world in peace, have courage, hold on to that which is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>